So thank you all for being with us uh, on the Friday morning slot, a tough one, especially in a very large room. So, but we're so happy to be all together and, and to have you with us. My name is Audrey Sellian um, with uh, Artha Networks, uh, a, a group that's been working on um, enabling uh, the, uh, the, the impact investment um, ecosystem in different ways, uh, trying to bring together uh, various uh, communities uh, that provide uh, deal flow and impact investors, uh, and our experience has been mostly in India. Um, I have the uh, pleasure to be with this incredible group of people this morning. We're so happy to see how the, the theme of um, indigenous communities and, and, and impact finance has uh, emerged and um, been elevated through the course of SOCAP this year. Um, and so this is sort of a, another, a, for us, a, a capstone session um, and an opportunity to share with you some of the thinking, some of the more creative thinking around how impact finance um, and blended finance uh, is being used creatively in the context of um, indigenous, and indigenous Native communities. And um, with me today, Crystal Cornelius um, uh, from Oista Corporation, um, Jeff Bowman from Bay Bank, which I just learned this morning is one of 17 native-owned banks um, in the US, um, and Nick Tilson from NDN. I'm gonna let you all do your introductions because I will not do justice to you to your work um, sufficiently. And then I'd, I'd propose that um, we then just kind of dive in with one or two big questions about uh, what, you know, what we're seeing, some of the more creative uh, and some of the more uh, salient uh, interventions that we're seeing in finance for your communities. So with that, Christelle. Good morning. Nina Nishnabe Kwe, Mekanekwa Jewish Kunigan Donji. My name is Crystal Cornelius, and I'm executive director of First Nations Oista Corporation. We are a national intermediary lender. We're a certified native CDFI, and we've been in this space for about 20 years. So really, our organization, um, through the gamut of the CDFI industry per se, has really helped propel the advent of sound and prudent lending institutions on in tribal communities across the United States. We're a nationwide organization, um, work in the 50 states as, um, and also work within uh, part of the 50 states, Alaska and Hawaii. One thing that uh, I think is really interesting about this panel per se, and a lot of what I do and a lot of the lending that I do as an intermediary is to um, relatively smaller loan funds, so we would say between a million and five million in assets, and working in persistent poverty counties, very rural communities. But in the scope of Indian country itself, and you look at the over 500 tribes, we really have become sophisticated financially within these systems. So one thing I really like about this panel and what we're going to be talking about, generally I'm talking about the, the need for capital within our rural communities, which is, is there, it, it's true, and, and we're a good bet, and we can talk about statistics and loan portfolio ratios and all of that good stuff in a moment. Um, but we also have, in the form of true self-determination, being we have this larger, lack of, of capital access to grow individual assets, community assets within tribal nations, communities, and sovereign nations. We're seeing within the, the, the composure, composition of this panel how incredibly um, sophisticated tribes can be in figuring out how to serve their people in larger measures and really thinking of new mindsets which align with cultural mores per se and capitalism and how we see these collective forms of capital actually really working and being very healthy. And I think we see this outside structure where a lot of people are trying to figure that out. So the intersection between SOCAP and what we're doing on financial levels uh, within Indian country, it's really like a perfect marriage, I feel, and we've been walking parallel for so long that I'm really excited to have this conversation, and hopefully with the, the small group, we can really get into um, some deep dialogue on what questions may be, perceptions may be, opportunities and such. So with that, I'll turn that over to you, Nick. Nick Tilson, 
uh, greet you in my Lakota language this morning. Um, thank you for, for being here. And I want to first acknowledge this is the land of the Ohlone people and the ancestors of this territory for allowing us to be here. Um, I, I come from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, and I was a former executive director of the Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation. And I was honored enough to be part of a, a movement of young people on Pine Ridge reconnecting to culture and spirituality and identity uh, through our ceremonies and our language. And, and um, that really gave us an increased sense of you know, commitment to place and responsibility to, to tackling these problems in our community. And so we created a pretty dynamic community development corporation and we um, you know, set on a journey to, to build a 21st century indigenous community from scratch um, in the poorest place in America. And we, uh, we didn't know anything about money or community development or loans or interest rates. Most of us had uh, um, predatory lent loans at the time with our cars and all these other things, but um, we, we wanted to build community. We wanted to solve systemic problems in our community, and so we, we became developers. We be became community developers, and 10 years later, Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation employs 125 people. Um, we have over about 57 different philanthropic partners, and we've leveraged about $75 million of new investment into our community on Pine Ridge and begin to revolutionize our thinking. Uh, and, and, and address systematic problems in our community. And in the journey, to, and in the journey to, of doing that work, um, our work was uplifted um, throughout Indian country and sort of outside of Indian country too. And, uh, and so we eventually were contacted by about 43 different tribes and 27 different native nonprofits comprised of over 70 different indigenous communities uh, all, all over the hemisphere who were saying, we wanna do something similar to Thunder Valley in our communities, but um, but unique to our culture, to our climate, to our place. Um, and Thunder Valley didn't have the capacity to, to really help them, so we just said, come, not thinking that they actually would. Um, and about 37 tribes have visited Thunder Valley over the past uh, few years, and we've just been sharing what we're doing. And so I guess like, uh, you know, probably about a year and a half ago, we went to the drawing table and said, what, 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 what kind of system, what, could, what kind of system would it take to scale what we're doing at Thunder Valley? Because I kept catching myself telling tribal leaders and communities, don't do what we did how we did it. It's madness and I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Um, you know, we just got done raising $3.7 million for an affordable housing project from 14 different sources. Um, and it's crazy, you know, and so, so the new organization that we're building that we'll talk about a little bit later is the Indian Collective of Reorganizing Philanthropy um, and basically building one of the, you know, building, building the biggest intermediary grant making fund geared towards indigenous people in the history of philanthropy. Uh, and we're in the process of building that now and, and creating partnerships and we're building a national CDFI that can run side by side with it. Um, so that we can do blended capital solutions to lift up native communities. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into the the meat and potatoes, I guess. <laughs> All right, thanks. Good morning, Poso, Boju, Suguli, Aho, Kola, Malse. That's how we say hi to each other in Wisconsin. Um, my name is Jeff Bowman. I'm from Bay Bank. Um, the United Nation is uh, owns a, um, a community bank. There's approximately 5,600 banks left in the country that are FDIC insured, and only 18 of them are Native American owned. So we um, are in a very special class, and there's about 150 uh, minority owned institutions. So um, we uh, uh, have a very targeted uh, approach to uh, affecting change in our community. The bank was started by the tribe about 23 years ago and initially went into partnership with some private individuals and the nation, they both put in half the money to start the bank. And the nation was interested in starting the bank because their tribal members were using predatory lenders, they weren't getting credit, they weren't getting mortgage loans, and when you lend money for mortgage loans in a native community, oftentimes the land is in trust and it makes it difficult to uh, get a lien. So to an inexperienced, inexperienced lender, 
um, that's problematic to them. They don't know how to figure that out. So one of the things that we specialize in is home ownership and just access to credit in general to the Oneida community. Um, the Oneida community is in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, the greatest football city here in the continent, if you say, <laughs> we're representing uh, Green Bay. <clears throat> um, the reservation is actually a combination of rural and urban, and part of the reservation actually um, uh, overlaps into the city of Green Bay. So the United Nations is very enterprising. Besides gaming, it owns hotels, commercial real estate, um, it has an engineering company, and one of the reasons to get into the banking business was their tribal members just couldn't get access to financial services. So we enjoy a very brisk business in our community. We originate a lot of consumer loans, um, and what it does is it shifts people out of uh, using payday lenders and title lenders. Um, we also make a lot of small dollar personal loans. That's a hard loan to get. You know, you, you can get that loan at a payday store and pay 600%, or you can come to the bank and, and get it at a very fair rate. And so we have um, 26 employees, nine of them are tribal members. Uh, the board is elected by the, um, the uh, tribal council, and four out of the five board members um, are tribal members, so there's a direct accountability back to the relationship. I um, mean, uh, to, uh, to the shareholder. And so we enjoy um, very good support from the tribe, but we operate on our own, autonomously, just like any other commercial bank. So, you know, we have everything all the other banks have, but what makes us unique is the target audience. And so we serve our tribal members. There's 11 tribes in Wisconsin, six are Ojibwe, and there's Menominee, Ho-Chunk, Stockbridge, uh, Oneida. And so what we do is, we have a lot of lending in our backyard, but then one of the things we've really um, developed over the last few years is reaching out to the other tribal nations in Wisconsin uh, to help them with projects. It might be a construction loan on a LIHTC deal where the tax credits will come into the project later to help uh, so, so that project doesn't have any debt, but the tribe may need an interim construction loan to create uh, the, the build these new houses. So we've figured out how to do pretty sophisticated stuff but be a small bank. And so when you're, I, I like to use the analogy in banking that we're a speedboat. And a lot of these big banks are battleships. You know, with a speedboat, you can turn like this, you can change your policy, you can change your focus really quickly. But for a really large organization, it's really hard for them to, you know, to be uh, agile. So we, um, we really enjoy this business and there's just a lot of work to do in our, in our communities. Thank you so much for these introductions. Um, and uh, I, would, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate you know, the opportunity to delve into some of, these, some of your respective experiences. I think uh, on some level, we should, I should probably um, refer to the title of our session uh, and, and just bear homage for one second to this sentiment that um, you know, the deification, the elevation of venture capital models especially given where, where we, the city we're sitting in today, uh, is kind of uh, an important, an important um, point to raise. Uh, there are particular um, value systems, there are particular um, aspects of one's appetite for risk, there's, one, there's particular aspects about one's approach to time, and, and the, the definitions of patience that I think are just so important. Um, in the context of raising up the next generation of young social innovators and those who just want to make change, the community developers, the, the, the friends that I, I imagine you worked with, for example, Nick. Um, could you speak a little bit more about some of, bearing that in mind, some of the examples of how you're looking at blending um, different types of finance with a very different mindset um, to help uh, spur the kind of, you know, enterprising activity that you want to see in your communities? Are there specific examples um, that you could share with us? I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, yeah, so in the building of, in the building of Thunder Valley, uh, even though we're doing all this dynamic development work, the whole project was about building up people. And this is the most underinvested community in America with 
that has never had unemployment rates ever in the history of the organ of, of history of the reservation have never had unemployment unemployment rates below 50 percent and poverty poverty rate poverty hovers around 70 percent I mean this this is a community who did not participate or benefit from the industrial revolution um, and this is different this is long this is entrenched poverty right this is not post Cleveland post Detroit kind of poverty um, and so um, and so you know in our work of building affordable housing and in, create, in doing job creation, we basically created what we call an ecosystem of opportunity. And this ecosystem of opportunity had to do with creating, uh, as a developer, actually creating, bringing infrastructure, raw infrastructure into the community, doing housing development, a workforce program, and then we basically created a worker-owned construction company and, that, and a workforce development program that ran side by side with it. The workforce development program was funded by grants through the Administration for Native Americans and the Vakirovich Foundation. And then um, our, then our uh, a TCAGA construction, our worker-owned construction company, that's where we took on PRI, PRI capital into that to launch that company. Um, and, and, they're, and they're the ones that are building the whole community at Thunder Valley right now. We were able to, it was interesting because as a developer, we became an anchor institution. And so we leveraged the fact that we were a developer and an anchor institution to think about launching enterprises so that in the development work that we were doing, we're actually being able to make sure that that development work was having impact in the community. Um, so then we, so then like what I didn't anticipate was how, how big Thunder Valley as an organization would grow. And so all of a sudden we ended up at this challenge where challenge and opportunity where we had 125 employees. And you know, with 125 employees and in the middle of a place that has a housing crisis for an organization who's trying to solve a housing crisis, I'm like, if I don't build housing for my workers, I'm going to lose <laughs> the workers and we're not gonna have impact. And so, um, so, we, so we launched on this you know, endeavor to, um, uh, to, to build a affordable housing pr project for employees that were working for Thunder Valley. And of course, we didn't have any equity. Um, and so we basically partnered, we partnered, we partnered with the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux community, uh, another, another tribe in Minnesota, and partnered with the Northwest Area Foundation. Um, they brought grant capital, so Shakopee invested about $600,000 in a grant. Northwest Area Foundation invested about $400,000 in a grant. And then we partnered with the we partnered with the South Dakota Housing Development Authority and took on about a one point a one point five million dollar um, loan and built affordable housing for our employees there. But it was through that partnership that they were understanding the Northwest Area Foundation and Shakopee were understanding they were doing two things by doing that. They were bringing equity into the project so that we could actually be able to accomplish. Um, the, the the balance sheet of the of the of the project and be able to afford the loan, but keep actually keep the rents down, but they were also understanding that they were making an investment into strengthening our balance sheet so that we were able to leverage other forms of capital as a part of the project. So there was like when you know when we were talking about impact and sort of the reason for for making those kinds of investment, there was I think ten different things. You know there was. Worker, you know, you know, housing for the workforce. There was increasing the balance sheet. There was all these different things that were all part of it, and taking on long-term capital from South Dakota Housing Development Authority too. So, those are that's an example of how we use sort of blended capital um, and stretched out the patience and uh, and brought and, and created a way for investors to to be involved in our work. Let me take a stab yeah. at it. Yes. So, you know, we're using the conventional bank model. Bank is just a financial intermediary, but I always tell people that banking is really easy. We rent money. We rent money from depositors, we pay them interest, and we mark it up and we make a loan with it. So you need to know the people that have the money, you need to know the people that need the money. But we've figured out how to get, uh, become very efficient at using uh, standard kind of tools available to every bank, and we've become experts in them. For example, uh, Indian Loan Guarantee. Uh, Indian Loan Guarantee is a loan guarantee program. It's like the U.S. Small Business Administration uh, Loan Guarantee, but it's under the Department of the Interior. And so we're closing a loan next week for a tribal project. This tribe is um, expanding their grocery store, 
and um, it's a, about a $3 million project. We're doing a $2.7 million loan. That loan will have a 90% guarantee on it. So we're trying to use tools that are readily available. That enhances the credit and it um, uh, mitigates our credit risk. It's a long-term loan. So this community has a, a nice grocery store. They're gonna have a beautiful grocery store uh, when this is done. And this particular community has a lot of tourist um, attractions because of uh, hunting lakes and uh, snowmobiling in the winter and stuff like that. And they're not catering to the non-native crowd right now. Um, their store from an uh, aesthetic standpoint isn't the most appealing, and, but this is going to be a beautiful modern grocery store. So we're, we were willing to step up and provide this loan, get credit enhancement on it. Another example is we use a loan product called HUD-184, and that is a, a mortgage loan that contemplates taking a lien on a house on trust land. So on many reservations, the land is checkerboarded between fee land and trust land. Some of the trust land might be in the tribe's name, some of it might be individual trust where it's assigned to you. So a conventional lender cannot take a lien on that land. It's held in trust. They'll never have the land as collateral. So that's a turnoff, you know, to some lenders. They just look at that and say, you know, Intellectually, I can't even wrap my head around that, and if I'm only going to make one or two loans, I'm really not going to put the time and effort into it. But this loan product contemplates that. So that loan is 100% guaranteed principal and interest by, um, by HUD, government agency. What that does for us is it provides liquidity. Our bank is about $100 million in assets, and then we have another $80 million of HUD-184 loans that we've originated, and to provide, we can't tie up all $80 million of our cash into 30-year fixed-rate loans. Um, we sell those loans, and then we're allowed to retain the servicing of it, and it can be used on fee land, trust land, so when you take $100 million on our balance sheet and $80 million in mortgages, we serve 100% of those borrowers are Native American. So we're using uh, pri you know, uh, tried and true tested products, but just applying it to Indian country, and it really gives us a competitive advantage because there's not a lot of banks that have built up that intellectual capital to figure out how do you use it, and, and we're really good at it. So you know, we're, we're using the traditional bank model, but we're, um, we're using some products that are off the shelf that are available to every bank. We've just figured out how to become you know, very efficient with them. So, you know, what we need is deposits to keep growing the bank and to make loans. You know, we need money. You know, we need to raise deposits. We're not doing a bond. We're not using patient capital from a foundation, although they could become a depositor. So I brought signature cards and a resolution with me. If anybody wants to open an account, you just make the check payable to Bay Bank and we'll take care of that after the session. As I um, briefly somewhat alluded to, uh, uh, my organization, First Nations Awista, we, uh, our, our target market is native CDFIs. We help um, fund and directly invest into native CDFIs through the tenure of our history. We have helped build up the CDFI industry per se from two to 77 today and about 30 more emerging NIC um, I'll be happy to say in a couple of years, we're not the only intermediary. Um, Nick will be an intermediary CDFI with his Indian collective model. So um, I'd, I'd like to just give a, a brief little tidbit of history so I can talk about this momentum endeavor um, that Awista is pretty proud of that we just put together recently. So when you look at Indian country per se, and each one of our individuals I believe on this panel is, is really um, portraying in their own aspect how under leveraged Indian country is. Uh, in regards to the native CDFI industry per se of our 77 CDFIs, we, uh, uh, First Nations Oista also does quite a bit of data collection and, and research. Um, we have net assets collectively um, amongst our research um, respondents, you know, on an average within the industry of 79%. So we have so much more debt and investments that we can take on and keep a healthy financial position. And what that really is showing is um, 
One and number two, an appetite for lending within Indian country per se. Maybe that's for larger development. Maybe that's in regards to building personal assets um, and community assets by ways of helping build private sector economies, home ownership, um, and building up consumer credit within Indian country per se. In looking at this, so if we look at 20 years to where we are today, um, another thing First Nations Awista has done is we have a financial literacy curriculum. It's the widest used curriculum in Indian country. It's called Building Native Communities, Financial Skills for Families. We're now on our fifth edition. And this is very important because our, our, our communities, um, we look at, at money, we look at transaction, and we look at value and assets much differently. Um, so learning how to balance that with capitalism per se and having lived in cash economies for so long, there really has been wonderful growth in finding that balance respectively and what that means for each tribal community itself. So they figure that out. But with the right tools and resources and capital to follow, we've gotten to a point now where in partnership with banks, 18 native banks created throughout the industry, CDFIs by and at large are non-depository institutions. We're revolving loan funds. So when our tribal members are ready to graduate out of our organizations, which they hope they do and go into mainstream financial systems, where are they going to keep their money in a safe and affordable place? So the intricacies of all of the, the forms of, of, of capital that we're seeing and the, the growth of Indian country per se is, is quite phenomenal. In, in that regard, and, and stopping there, generally First Nations Awista is the, the first investor um, of debt into native CDFIs. And there's a, a myriad of reasons for that. It could be Indian country is deemed risky. Um, a lot of people who are interested in investing in one way or another within Indian country simply don't know how, or they don't have a connect. So rather than going into some of those barriers with that, um, we have been a very successful lender for the past 20 years. We've revolved over $17 million in Indian country. 20 years lending, we've had one loan default and it was $10,000. I made that loan, knew it could be risky. Um, that was about six, seven years ago, but that still equates to 0.01%. And re in reflection of that, our, our native CDFI's portfolios are very, very strong as well. So with all of the success, what we find as um, an intermediary, we've got a very robust um, portfolio, loan portfolio with our native CDFIs, as well as a very robust investment portfolio in order to lend the funds. But of our more tenured organizations um, that really have been embedded in their communities for the past 10, 15 years, they're still not able to garner the investments they need to meet target market demand, period. So they're coming back to, to OISTA for money and based on our own concentration levels because CDFIs, and this isn't just the native industry, at large, the whole CDFI industry, unless you're a bank or a credit union, and are unregulated institutions. So we are regulated by our, po our loan policies and procedures. With that quagmire per se, I've got 10, 15 native CDFIs and I've already got 800,000 out to you and based on your balance sheet and my concentration, I really can't do anything for you. Um, and we don't have other people jumping in. So what uh, has transpired, and this was uh, an idea about two years ago and it wasn't a Wista's brainchild by any means of the imagination, a very dedicated foundation to Indian country, a Northwest Area Foundation. They have an eight state region and they have dedicated 40% of their giving and assets to Indian country and a lot of their, their states actually encompass quite a bit of tribes. We hosted essentially a round table discussion um, with the finance leaders within Indian country and we're saying, what can we do about this? Nobody's jumping in. Um, we need money, our communities need this money for, for growth and really building healthy economies within some of the most um, marginalized communities in the United States. So we came up with the idea for a capital aggregate pool. So with that, um, uh, the, the communities and the, the native CDFIs felt OISTA was the vehicle in which to um, develop and, and monitor um, and capitalize the pool. So with that, it was a two-year process. And what we did first is we brought together a steering committee of native CDFIs so we could see what was their appetite, what did they, you know, what would they look like, look, what would they would like to look at in 
terms of policy, in terms of time, in terms of cost of the capital. And then we started talking to potential investors and partners to see what they would feel comfortable with. So we came together with a very happy medium. And what's interesting about this capital pool, so I'm happy to say um, we did put together the first of its kind $10 million capital pool for Indian country. Um, we've deployed all of that money within the last three months. But within this measure, this is not something new in the finance world. A lot of you, or for those of you that work globally, this happens all the time. Capital pools and the strength collectively of organizations. Um, so this isn't, you know, as I indicated, a brainchild of Awista or the CDFIs per se. It's been done, but what's so phenomenal about this is number, um, number one, based on the rigorous financial underwriting we did on these organizations, which was, um, a prerequisite of, of some of our funders, which are banks and foundations and, and um, private individuals and such. Normally, and we do have a very rigorous underwriting criteria per se for our CDFIs, um, but we did a full CAMEL analysis on our pool participants, um, which is much different than looking at impact. It's, it's, it's purely finance driven for those of you that, that don't necessarily lend, we won't get into that. So initially, we had 19 CDFIs apply for capital that were ready. Um, the terms are at least 500,000 you would have to take, up to a million dollars, 10-year money. That's a really big issue as well, because for us, that's patient capital. It is so incredibly hard for my organization to get anything longer than five years for our investors. So when we look at really making long-term systemic change, a lot of organizations have access to 10-year 10, 10 money, 15-year money, 30-year money. We are elated and over the moon about 10-year money um, with this. And what's really nice about it as well is they had to show the demand, obviously. They're able to get this money out the door within a year. And they still have a need for more capital. So with us and what's so innovative is we finally... I think we're, we're coming to a really exciting trajectory within Indian country. One of our biggest, in my personal opinion, obstacles um, really is invisibility. And that's not the fault of, of you know, our potential partners or America at large, because in all honesty, unless you live in a concentrated area where there happens to be native presence, there's so much going on in the world, um, you don't really have to think about us. And I'm not saying that in, in a rude manner. But when we look at equity and we look at diversion and we look at inclusion and we look at all of these aspects that are really at a forefront of America, we as native people are still kind of standing here like, we're still here. You know what? So, so with this, and, and this really does tie in, I think, just collectively to the pool, with the success that we've shown by and large by ourselves through efforts of great partnerships and self-determination, 18 native banks, regenerative community models now being used and sought after all over Indian country, creating capital pools um, with a myriad mixture of, of financing and people belief in that, we have so much more we can do and we have um, so much to teach, I think, in, in another aspect as well with outside partners just in how to make capital work for good that's not extractive um, within their policies to the community, to the earth, to um, the, true, the, the true nature of, of partnerships. And I think with, I think collectively, what do we have, 60, 70 years experience up here? I don't know, that's kind of scary. We do though. <laughs> um, the more and more we can, you know, uplift our visibility um, and our successes, I think the better it will be for humanity at large, our people at large, and um, really trying to shift capital in a measure that can work for good, and it has and it can, and I think we're somewhat proof of that on this panel today. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the one thing that strikes me is that there's, uh, there's no doubt that there is an immense absorptive capacity within the com these communities for this type for for the capital that we're here at SOCAP talking about. And there have been 10, well, there have been, I think this is the 11th SOCAP. So there's been, you know, 10, 10, 11 years of the same discussion about how capital can be deployed for good and for co in collective structures. 
um, to be able to support some of the more the, the conscious um, aspects of, of capitalism, basically. This is, this is what the movement is all about. I just wonder, and I'm conscious of the people in the room and what you all bring as well to this discussion. Um, I, I'd ask that perhaps we uh, together just pause for you know pause and reflect for a moment starting starting with with you all here but i invite the audience as well to to ask questions or or raise points we're here at socap um, to really enhance the visibility of this work and of the opportunity and um i, I have a pretty good sense of the uh, ecosystem infrastructure that that i've seen emerge in 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 um, in india uh, and, and I've seen what that infrastructure has attracted, a high concentration of patient capital and, in a, and a willingness of some very large foundations and private wealth holders, high net worth individuals, um, to think differently about how they're going to deploy and allocate their money. And it's not about finding unicorns. It's really not. It's, uh, there's a whole zebra movement here, and that's a whole other thing. But it's really about finding the enterprises and the, and the entrepreneurs and the organizations that are really able to think about sort of cooperative and collective models. So we're here. What's the moonshot? What's the? I mean, next we're gonna we're gonna come back and make sure, um, you know, in, in 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 all of this audience and all the people who've come to all the many panels related to these communities this year. What's the, what's the ask? What do you envision? Um, uh, happening over the next couple of years in terms of uh, the movement and how it may benefit your work. And again, I invite all of you to raise your hands and also participate. Yeah, I, I want to answer that one, add, add to it a little bit. I mean, like when we started thinking about impact, like indigenous communities are largely overlooked in the conversation. And if you actually really think about it, so 80% of the world's fossil fuels that are left are on indigenous people's land. 90% of the world's biodiversity that is left is on indigenous people's land. So all, all, all impact investors, donors, all kinds of folks that are trying to make an impact and fight climate change and all these things, there's no way that they're going to do that without interacting with indigenous communities and indigenous people. And that means indigenous people and communities in this hemisphere. Why, why is it that the biodiversity that's left on the planet is left with indigenous people? And why the fossil fuels that are still left in the ground are on indigenous communities? It's because indigenous people have been protecting them. People have been fighting for them. So when we're talking about making investments into our communities, um, your strength, you're, you're strengthening a broader movement to be able to fight some of the most important issues that is facing humanity today. It's not just about solving poverty on Pine Ridge or helping Standing Rock, but we're talking about big, huge global problems that indigenous people are at the cross intersection of. And the fact that we have survived what this country has dished out to us, the fact that native communities are the byproducts of a system that is broken in this country, and if this movement is about fixing that system, it needs us to do that. And we need this movement to, to be able to save our communities and rebuild them. And so, you know, we have to be thinking, we have to be thinking big and we have to be thinking bold. And that means people in this sector have to behave differently. Less than 0.3% of all philanthropy in America goes to native communities. And it's on a 30% decline over the past 30 years, right, over the past 10 years. And so, you know, like the work that we're doing with, India, with the Indian Collective, you know, we're trying to make the biggest power play move in the history of philanthropy to get philanthropy to behave differently. So we want to create a fund that starts doing $50 million of grant making to Indian country every single year because that's what, that's, what, that's what the need is. There's about a need for somewhere between eight and $10 billion of capital in order to transform Indian country. And so these are, these are big questions. And in the cross intersection of that, it's solving places in this country where the poorest communities are, where the most inequity is that, that, that's happening, and also at the cross intersection of what climate justice looks like. And, and arguably where the highest, the, the most compelling impact metrics can be derived. We spend lots and lots of hours talking about those metrics and how they may be found and measured. And yeah, there's a huge opportunity there. 
Jeff, did you have thoughts? Um, and you know, we're going to focus on the day-to-day -day, um, opportunities to provide access to capital. You need capital to start a business. We want to support those uh, nascent Indian-owned businesses. Um, but there's a lot of things that um, are just real simple building blocks that we're going to focus on every day. One of the things that I'm most proud of is our consumer lending business. We originate between five to 600 consumer loans to our tribal members every year. It's about $3 million of annual volume. And what's unique about the, uh, about the profile of the borrower, about a year ago, I dissected the data because I was just curious what's going on with their financial life. Um, half of the loans, the people had credit scores less than 600. You're not gonna get that loan if you don't get it from us, okay? And we're charging very fair rates. And it sounds, you know, it makes the, in that person's life, it's, it makes a world of difference to make them an eight or a $10,000 loan to buy a car to get to work. If you don't have a car, reliable transportation, you cannot be successful, especially if you're in a rural community where you have to drive to work. So, you know, if you have poor credit, you can go to a, um, a car dealership and use their high-risk funding and pay 36%, or you can come to us and we'll charge 8%, okay? So it's very fair. That, there's another byproduct of that. The other thing that I'm really proud of is the staff development. When I arrived at the bank six years ago, we had one tribal employee. Today, we have nine. So we're building up the capacity of the business so that we have Native people learning how to become bankers. Okay, so that's another impact, like if your economic development work, your economic development work, not only are we affecting change with the customers that we touch, but we're building up our staff so that we can participate and do the exact same things Bank of America is doing, or what that banker learned at Citibank. We're doing the exact same thing, so I think that's, you know, we're gonna keep working uh, on that. Just one last thing. If you look at my profile sheet on this app, I loaded a document, a fact sheet on the bank. If you want to learn more about the bank, just find my name on the app and you can, you can see the, some more information about the bank. Fantastic. Crystal? I'll make my closing um, uh, short. I'd really like to hear from the audience. Um, and this is going to sound a, a little vague, maybe some data tied in, but my moonshot, honestly, is for our people to have enough and we're not, we're not at enough. And I, I think collectively and with cultural mores, native people are people are not greedy people. Um, in essence, when you really look at what is, is held up as, and true and honorable, that person that keeps to himself or hoards to himself has the least respect in the tribe. <laughs> so we're really looking at a 180 degree turnaround, but um, Treasury, Department of Treasury, CDFI fund, put out a study. They put out several studies in regards to the industry at well, and they do quite a bit of data collection and research uh, on Native communities, and it showed that um, collectively, Indian country has a $77 billion capital gap. And if we, now this is what's scary, if we had that $77 billion right now on what was needed for infrastructure, for loans, for everything that that money can do, it would still take us 40 years to catch up to the poorest in mainstream America. That's four decades. So my moonshot is getting there, working myself out of a job where there's no need for a WISTA, there's no need for an intermediary because we have a financial system and structure that's participatory through all different financing agents and getting to a point in the end where there's still a narrative on reservations and it breaks my heart and I'm from the reservation. Um, that you need to get an education and you need to leave home because there's no opportunities for you back home. We need our kids home. We need, we need people coming to our communities, to rural communities, because of the, the life and, and the breadth of um, what we have to offer. And I think that there's such a void in humanity at this juncture that's looking for that connection, for that community. We have what you're looking for in that regard, and, and, and in order to just somewhat spread 
that message or um, really social, social justice. I, I would like to see capital and social justice aligned, not only for our people, um, but what we're doing for the globe um, and nationally, because we're really at a trying point. If we don't start looking right now at what we do seven generations ahead, um, I fear for my, my grandchildren I'll never meet, and I think we all should. So the time for change really is now. Thank you so much. Um, I'm getting strong signals from the back that unfortunately we don't have time for, for the questions from the audience, but I would encourage you please to come forward and, and, and just, you know, please uh, ask directly. We'll have the opportunity, hopefully, to continue this conversation in other forums um, and in, other, in, in, in as many of the other conferences and convenings as the ecosystem um, brings together. And so thank you all for being with us this morning. And thank you to this esteemed panel uh, for the opportunity to learn. Thank you.